Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We're now uh, resuming our meeting in public session. Good afternoon, uh, Professor Drudy. Um, just before we commence our proceedings, once again, colleagues, to remind you, um, mobile phones, either turn them off or to flight mode. As I say, it's not just the interference with the committee, it's the recording and the broadcast of it. So if you have a mobile phone, if you've turned them off or to flight mode. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2.1 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue so to do so, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening sp statements submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting and members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I'm pleased to welcome Professor uh, PJ Drudy from Trinity College. Um, your submission uh, has been received and circulated to members. I do know some of the members were having technical problems and there are hard copies here. If anybody would like them, we can circulate them. Does anybody need a hard copy? Everybody. Uh, at this stage, uh, as I say, the doc your document has been circulated. I'd ask uh, you, Professor, if you'd like to make an opening statement or a summary of the document, and then I'll ask colleagues, uh, of course, invite colleagues to ask you a number of questions. Well, thank you, Chairman, and thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to get the opportunity to talk to this committee because I think you can play a key role in changing things. And it's very heartening, really, to have a committee of this kind now with a broad spectrum of, of views, really. And uh, people I already know uh, who are interested in housing, and uh, that's very heartening. So it gives me confidence for the future. Um, when I, you were asked, I, I was asked to do something in the private rented sector, but I felt that I needed to range a little broader because I see a very important link between the three tenures, between owner occupation, the private rented sector and social housing. As an example, if we had a very good private rented sector with regulated rents, as I'll talk about later, with good standards and with security of tenure, then people wouldn't be so desperate to get on this so-called housing ladder. They would say, well, okay, happy as Larry in the private rented sector, I'm secure, good standard, and the price is not unreasonable. So it's very important to see the linkage. And similarly, if we had more social housing, then there wouldn't be such a desperate need or demand for private housing. But I'm not dismissing private housing, of course, but I'm saying that there's a very, very clear link. Now, if I get on to it, the main thing I'm, I make in the paper, I suppose, is that in, the, in Table 1, I show, I think, fairly clearly that effectively we have commodified housing, almost exclusively commodified housing over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, where if you have money, you can buy a house, or if you can get access to money, you can buy a house. If you have sufficient money, you can rent a house. If you haven't, you don't get it. Now, that's a real problem as far as I'm concerned. I should also say, by the way, under non-market there, I have 465 homes actually built. Now, I'm not suggesting that it's the only house provided, because, of course, the local authority is uh, acquiring housing. And I suppose the total, probably, if you talk about provision, in a wider sense, it would be something close to 8,000. But I would suggest to you that acquiring houses is not necessarily a good idea because the state is in fact in competition with lots of young people who want to buy. So in fact the state is participating in the escalation of prices. So I would argue that what is really important for the state to do is to build houses, build more of them. And 465, frankly, is quite shameful. There's no excuse for it that I can see. So that's the first point I make, really. And basically, the vulnerable 
whether they have disabilities or they're travellers or ordinary people, have to live in cars or live in hotel rooms for weeks and months on end. And there's something radically wrong with a situation like that. And this committee, I believe, probably for the first time in a very long time, is a, a glimmer of hope for the likes of me. And, of course, despite the crash, looking at buying a house, despite the crash, nothing has changed. We've learned virtually nothing. I saw an interesting quote on the Irish Times this morning by a guy called Grantham, Jeremy Grantham. He was a, an iconic investor. And Grantham was asked what lessons had been learned from the global turndown in 2008. And his answer was, we will learn an enormous amount in a very short time. A medium term, we will uh, learn a, a certain amount. And in the long term, we will learn nothing. And that is our position in this country. We have learned nothing from the 2008 crash, it seems. Because we have exactly the same problems now, escalating prices to buy a house, escalating rents and bad standards, and very few social housing units. The very same as I wrote about 10 years ago, in 2005. The three same problems are with us today as were with us 10 years ago. So, basically, I think, and I, I have a diagram there which shows you that houses are actually overvalued. We can talk about the reasons later on. As regards the private rented sector, well, it doesn't work. It's not fit for purpose at the moment. And really, escalating rents, you saw this morning, uh, on average, rents rose by 10%. Now, that is completely out of line with inflationary tendencies. And there's something wrong, in my view, with that. Uh, I can go on, but the case for the private rented uh, regulation in a few moments, if you want. I won't do it now. But basically, it's an unsatisfactory sector at the present time. And it shouldn't be, because it could play a key role in helping us, as all sectors could, all three. So I suppose I then have a set of recommendations, and, and the key issue as far as I'm concerned, and I hope I can persuade you to this, is that we need to change our philosophy, and as a result, our policies. If we do not do so, I promise you that we will be here in 10 years' time or in 20 years' time with the same problems. So we've got to begin to look at housing as a home, as a human right, rather than as a commodity as something for speculation and for wealth creation. People say, I'm sitting on a gold mine. It's wrong. I own my own house. It shouldn't be the price it is. I bought it for 40,000 in 1980. It's now possibly worth half a million, 700,000. Why should it be? What did I do to deserve that? Nothing. I did a bit of painting here and there. But really, there's no excuse for that sort of escalation of prices. And you can see from my diagram that really it came down for a while and up she goes again. So I see that as wrong. Now, I refer to cost rental, Chairman. I don't want to, I, I'll stop in a moment if you want, and you stop me any time you like. A cost rental model is very important. Social housing is critical, as I said. But I think that. It's very important to cater for a whole range of society who currently are finding it very difficult, as well as the people at the bottom of the tree, those who have, you know, on social welfare or whatever, but the guard, the teacher, the nurse, those people are struggling to buy. And it seems to me that if we had a situation in this country where we had cost rental, what I would cost a cost rental model, where the state would build homes and rent them for the cost of the mortgage. So they would be effectively regulating rents and the people who rent them, the guard, the teach, teacher, the nurse, etc., etc., would be secure, there'd be security of tenure and the standards obviously would have to be good. So I'm suggesting to you that a cost rental model is very well worthwhile considering. The NESC people, the National Economic and Social Council, has also agreed with me on that. I was on about this 10 years ago. But I honestly believe it's one way to travel, as well as, of course, we must cater for uh, people who are in need of social housing. It's absolutely essential. And then I do make the, situ the comment that providing 75,000 homes via the private rented sector is very foolish. I think it's quite mad. 
You cannot expect private landlords who want to make money, as much money as possible. It's logical that they would. You cannot expect them to provide for social needs. They will not do They cannot be expected to do so. So it is the responsibility of the state, in my view. Uh, anyway, I won't go on, Chair, but perhaps that's a start. And you'll want to quiz me on these things and put me down in various... My colleagues would be very anxious to, to quiz you, Professor Trudy. Thank you for your opening comments. Uh, the first person who indicated they had a number of questions is Deputy O'Brien. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, PJ, uh, for the, the presentation. Um, I suppose really the questions are more just to get you to tease out the, 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 the different bits of your presentation. One of the points that I think is often lost in the debate is, is when those of us who are advocating a return to large-scale social housing build is that we're only advocating for the people who will live in those houses, as opposed to exactly as you said, reducing the pressure on the private rental sector and the owner-occupy sector. And I just, I'd like you to tease out a little bit more what you see as the overall benefits to the housing system from increasing the supply of social housing and the benefits to the, the young professional private renter or the first-time buyer elsewhere in the system, if you could. I'm also, I mean, on the, on the, the 75,000 HAP units, in fact, if you look at Alan Kelly's strategy, over 80% of the units in his 100,000 unit strategy are private sector units. You have 75,000 HAP, but you also have the long-term leased units, etc. Um, and again, one of the issues is people are talking about the need to return to large-scale social housing building, but there seems to be a reluctance to return to the traditional single-tenure council estates. And I'm wondering, is there a way of combining cost rental with differential rent to create council estates that are mixed income but single tenure to kind of improve the way of doing large scale? Have you thoughts on that? I'd like to know your thoughts on rent regulation. We had conversations this morning and we've been discussing, you know, the merits, for example, of, of rent certainty in terms of linking rents to the CPI or rent controls in terms of some other model. Do you have a, a preference on that? For those of us that wouldn't know the detail of cost rental, maybe you could talk a little bit about how that operates as well. And I suppose the last question is, there's a lot of talk about house prices uh, for owner-occupiers and how to increase access to purchasing and to credit. I would have thought a more important policy objective is to find ways of reducing the cost of purchasing houses as your primary objective. What's your thoughts around that kind of dilemma about, is it about increasing the supply of credit or reducing the cost of the unit to the purchaser and how would you do that? Thank you, Deputy. Professor, do you want to address some of those? Well, I, I hope I, you've quite a lot there. You mentioned social housing. I, I think you were getting at the idea of why social housing and the benefits from it. I hope I have it right. But basically, I see enormous benefits from the provision of social housing because there's a, lo a very large number of people now on waiting lists, close to 100,000. And I mean, housing is closely related to health, good health. Housing is closely related to uh, productivity. People cannot possibly be productive in any society or healthy unless they are properly housed. So, I mean, I would see, uh, and, and indeed ethical, uh, ethics come into it and morality. How can we tolerate a situation where people are on the street? Or, you know, I mean, there are so many arguments for social housing. It's unbelievable, in fact, that we have built so few, and how we have gone back. It's just to do with philosophy. But if we believe that housing is a fundamental requirement of any society, surely to goodness, we have to believe that social housing, on the traditional model, as you said, that local authorities provide them. And mind you, local authorities, though, should manage them properly. And local authorities have not been good at that. And they have not been good at collecting rents. And there are issues about social housing, such as handing on the, you know, a social, uh, flogging them, for example. I personally disapprove totally of flogging off social housing because all you're doing is reducing the stock. So we're acquiring houses at market prices and we're flogging them off at a discount price. That, to me, makes no sense. And so I would, I would say that we have to build up the stock of social housing, I would say, to something like 30% of the total. It's now, what? The few percent. So, would that mean numerically, if you were to have 30%, how many actual social housing units do you think that would be? Well, I think you'd have a, f a, f a few. Uh, at the moment, we have about 100 and over 100,000, so we probably would have 400,000. But I think you'd have to manage them properly now. Hmm. 
and I don't know how you would link it to cost rental because the social housing would normally be the, the differential rents and the rents would be probably very low. While in the cost rental situation, I'm thinking of a viable repayment of the mortgage. So, you know, for, for, for the guard or the teacher, it wouldn't be a rent of perhaps 1,500, but it, it might be a rent of 1,000. But it would be secure and it would be in line with inflationary tendencies and it would be secure and it would be good standard. So I think there are slightly different categories, but I still would argue that the state could provide cost rental. Now, no doubt, uh, people in the private rental sector would say, oh, we're going to do it for you. And they're coming out of the woodwork now to propose social housing. I, I, I'm not going to name.